Welcome back to the channel. Today, Little Round Top. So I was just sort of mucking around online looking for... for actually, I was just mucking around online and um, something popped up in my recommended feed um, about the movie Gettysburg. I love the movie Gettysburg. It's a fantastic movie. I think it's like four hours long. Uh, I think there's a director's edition. Um, always watch the director's edition. It's way better than the other one, but it's, it's very long. Uh, it's normally called like the most historically accurate movie ever. Uh, I love it. So I thought that I'd just uh, go through this, this scene where the 20th Maine does their famous bayonet charge. And uh, not look at how accurate it is, because the entire thing is pretty much just accurate. But uh, point out all the little things like uh, the use of sergeants and and the, the, the sort of way they use their bayonets, which is really cool and uh, very authentic. So just for those who have not who are not up on the Gettysburg, um, we're here at Little Round Top. I'm not sure if you can see the mouse, but um, down in the southern part. Uh, the Peach Orchard plays a big deal in the in the earlier part. I believe that's where Badan's sharpshooters started first engage the Confederates. Uh, there's basically a bulge in the in the Union line. Uh, I cannot remember his name, but one of their commanders basically um, ignore this stuff here. This is the first day of the battle that we're interested in the second part. This is just the clearest image I could find. Um, so the the Union line has sort of bulged out. Uh, I believe Hood has then counterattacked it, uh, or Hood was meant to attack it anyway. So Hood's just swept this this bulge forward, and now the assaults on Little Round Top and Big Round Top uh, are going to commence. Uh, the Devil's Den is pretty much uh, the skirmishing involved in the Devil's Den. It's it's pretty important, but we're not looking at that today. Um, Hood is actually uh, hit rather early, um, so Hood is can't organise his division, which is sort of what uh, a lot of people will blame for the the failure of it. Is that Hood was not able to coordinate the attacks, and therefore they just sort of went in piecemeal. Or um, that's not strictly correct, but essentially the attacks were not as well coordinated as they could have been. Uh, because of Hood's death, so on. This whole thing could have been... Uh, there's a meme around Gettysburg, which is the word practicable. Um, Lee's orders were basically to take that hill if practicable. And um, the person in charge basically said, well, I thought it wasn't practicable, when Lee's order should have been take the hill. And uh, because the hill wasn't taken, there was this big... Essentially, essentially the, the Confederates were trying to take Little Round Top and then sort of push around behind the Union line. They're also doing the same thing over on Culp's Hill. Um, that's actually very interesting. There's, there's good photographs of, uh, I believe, what they call it Saddle Ridge or something like that, where you can just see trees shredded with mini balls. I'll try and find a, a photograph of that and put in the final thing. But uh, yeah, trees just shredded with bullets. Uh, total destruction. The Confederates actually managed to take it briefly. Um, that's actually a pretty entrenched position. It's really cool. I might cover that later. But uh, for now, let's take a look at Gettysburg. Okay, so the, the oh, I should set up here. The setup is that the 20th Maine are basically the end of the Union line. Uh, the 20th Maine have now run out of ammunition. Effect, essentially, they've run out of ammunition. Some guys might have some left, but they're pretty much out. Um, something that's really cool is, uh, most aside from a few key regiments like the 69th New York, who were pretty much armed with uh, smoothbore muskets, most uh, most regiments sort of had a mix of weapons in their in their units so some guys might only have smooth bores some might have rifled enfield some might have springfield so it's uh confederates were way worse with that like your yeah, ammunition was just insane any confederate quartermaster would have just just gone insane trying to deal with it all but um the union was a little bit better but essentially they've run out of ammunition and they can't be resupplied um so their only choice now is to either retreat, in which case the Confederates will just pour through and get into their rear, or they can charge. And what, uh, what the Colonel decides to do is to charge down the hill like a, a swinging door. So don't just charge and sort of hit the Confederates and then sort of uh, like that, but actually charge down and, and meet them. And let's, uh, let's have a look at the way they do that. Oh, by the way, this captain that he speaks to here, um, that's probably accurate because in the we're talking about the Civil War, that's total chaos, utter chaos. Um, you had, so, in some cases, like majors leading regiments or, or colonels leading brigades, so the ranks don't really matter, but um, on paper, that would be a major's job, um, which it's fine that it's not a major. It's actually more accurate that it's not a major, but anyway, this is what a major actually does in a regiment. Um, not a lot of... This is really good for what um, leaders in a regiment actually do. So uh, what the captain does is exactly textbook what a major was supposed to do. Lead a wing of the, army, uh, lead a wing of the battalion... Uh, do some sort of like special task with a few companies. It's absolutely perfect. Some of the boys got 
nothing at all. Sir, sir, what do we do for ammunition? My boys have to grab muskets and they're back with them. Sir, we ought to pull out. No, we can't do that. We can't hold them again, sir. You know that. Well, if we don't, they go on by and over the hill and the whole flank caves in. True. Sir. Here they come. Uh, you'll see these red um, iron cross type things. Uh, that is a core symbol. So the uh, the uh, Union Army developed a system where you would have a core badge on your hat. I believe you see um, a couple of guys have them on their uh, on their uniforms or that sort of thing. So yeah, that, that little red thing is a, is a core recognition symbol. If we stay here, we can't shoot. So let's fix bayonets. We'll have the advantage of moving down the hill. They gotta be tired, the revs. They gotta be close to the end of Colonel Chamberlain, by the way. Bayonets. Ellis, wait, Ellis, you take the left wing, I'll take the right. See I want that? right wheel forward of the whole regiment. What do you mean, charge? That's exactly what a, what a major would be doing. Like, here, you take this half of the brigade. Oh, sorry. You take this half of the battalion and do a thing with it that's sort of in conjunction with me, but maybe you're refusing the flank. Maybe you're, you're sweeping around. So that's, it's very, very good that they show this. Yes, but here's what we do. We're going to charge swinging down the hill. Just like we pulled back to this left side of the regiment, now we're going to swing it down. We swing like a door. We're going to sweep them down the hill just as they come up. Understand? Does everybody understand? Yes, yes sir. sir. Okay, Ellis, you take the left wing, and when I give the command, I want the whole regiment to go forward swinging down to the right. All right, sir. Fine. I love the beards of the Civil War, too. That's really cool. But uh, notice how there's a lot of officers in one place. This would probably be a company commander meeting. Um, the Lieutenant uh, Chamberlain's brother, I'm not sure how he factors, factors into it, but I think he's his ADC, so that, that might work. But uh, this is what would happen. The, the captains would give the lieutenants sort of temporary command, which is where lieutenant comes from, by the way. They're left in the tenancy of command. Sort of, that's why it's called lieutenant or, uh, or lieutenant if you use the actual French pronunciation. So the, the captains would just leave the lieutenants and sergeants to manage everything, go to a sort of staff meeting, uh, and then proceed from there. Uh, in the Napoleonic Wars, these guys would mostly be mounted or have some access to a horse. And um, they were actually ordered to stop having these meetings in direct fire of the enemy. So, a um, little tangent there. Move. You see that? the um, A lot of shows seem to just have the colonel yell something. And then everyone just does it. But what would happen here is the, the colonel would yell then the sergeants and the captains would all repeat that order. So the officer gives the order, everyone else relays that order. Um, in the British Army, that would probably have been a, uh, a much more dignified thing, but this is the American Army in the Civil War. Yeah, that's perfectly accurate to do that, to just scream. I like the dead bodies too, because this is like the fourth or uh, the third or fourth charge up the hill. It's all shot on vacation too, really, really awesome. Okay, you see the man with his hand up there? That's a sergeant. I believe that's a, is that a first sergeant or a sergeant major? I can't see the um, the rank there too well, but that's some kind of NCO with his hand up. And that's exactly what we should see. So the, the officer is commanding the men to go to this point, and then the sergeants are directing them from there. So generally, the, a general rule is... Officers instruct and then sergeants do the fine tuning. So the sergeant is actually getting them in line. You can actually see guys in the background here, um, sergeants or lieutenants, uh, file fillers or, or rank fillers, they were sort of called, getting the men into the ranks. And if someone dies, they sort of direct men into that hole. Um, that was the real rank, the real role of sergeants on the battlefield was to, to assist the commander in instructing, not to be some sort of uh, uh, like a, a grandfather figure on the battlefield or a father figure, like maybe off the battlefield. But on the battlefield, their job was to to keep the unit together as a fighting force, whereas the officer's job was to direct that fighting force to the enemy. Also notice none of the men have bayonets fixed. They wait until they get into formation, then fix bayonets. It's very important. You know what chaos are doing. And the officer, of course, in the front. See the Confederates all sort of like disorganized and and um, no bayonets on. They're all disorganized, just standing and firing whenever they want. That's exactly why you need officers and sergeants. Um, in this particular assault, they they pretty much had known that the Union were out of ammunition, so they're not really 
expecting anything. Like historically, this is this is as accurate. As, this is perfectly accurate. But um, generally, like this is a good example of why you really need sergeants and officers to to maintain unit cohesion. Because if you don't, men get really confident, and they just start, oh, stand still and pop up a shot, and then then you next thing you know, half the battalions in front of you and the other half are doing what you're doing, and it just toes into total chaos. But um, that's accurate for this assault. But uh, generally, this is a good example of why you really, really do need those sergeants and, and, and junior officers. You can actually see one in front, there's a sergeant there. That's really cool to see. Uh, charge bayonets is the, the pose where you see the man with the bayonet down. Uh, you don't see that often in, in movies and TV shows, but that's actually what you would, the order you would be given before the actual order to charge. It's really cool they showed that too, because it's, uh, it's just not something you see, but it's something that would have been an absolute routine for every single battalion level action in the last 200 years. It's rarely ever seen in movies. It's really, really cool to see that. Uh, you don't just charge from the... Um, uh, shoulder arms or, or uh, right shoulder shift, which is sort of up on the shoulder. Uh, Americans used right, British used left, and then different countries go from there. But anyway, uh, yeah, you would actually charge bayonet before ordering a charge. It's, it's a really cool to see that in a, in a movie. Left wing, right wheel. Right wheel! Charge. The bugle's really cool too. Again, the bugle would be, that's how you relay orders before walkie-talkies. Um, I know early in the movie they had this um, discussion about their particular uh, brigade, I think it was, has a particular, oh, was it their brigade or their regiment? One of them had a particular, like, um, there was a bugle call before the bugle call to tell you that it was for your brigade, but of course here they're by themselves, so, effectively by themselves, so it didn't, it didn't matter. Ah! Yeah. That's just such a one of the most lackluster deaths I've seen on, on film. Slowly pouring down. Okay. Um, something you're going to see is something really cool, and it's something that you'll miss unless you really, unless you knew it was there. It's one of those things you miss unless you know what to look for. Uh, you're going to see a lot of clubbing, and that's an American thing. Americans, for some reason in this period, have a, just a fascination with using their muskets. These like these weapons that are very fine tuned, and they give you a bayonet to use for a reason. They just use them like clubs, and we see that back in the in the Revolution, in the French Indian War, um, when they're provincial troops. They uh, pretty much every war America fights up until like the 1890s. They love to use their muskets as clubs, so you're going to see a lot of clubbing. Um, some of them actually had reinforced, like um, not in this era, but uh, in the earlier period, when uh, companies and regiments were much more of a private affair, um, they would actually reinforce the buttstocks to use them as clubs. So, um, yeah, it's really cool to, to see that, um, and it's good that they included that. Uh, most of these, oh, in fact, everyone who's not an officer, uh, who's not a main character, sorry, is pretty much a volunteer reenactor. So all of these guys would be heavily into their volunteering, they would all, uh, into their reenactment, they would all know that, and so, even if they were just told, okay, get into some kind of combat, and guys would just naturally club, it's, it's using reenactors in films is something I should, they think, either, is something I think should, they should really do more of, because it brings that authenticity to a film, and if you start screwing with history too much, the reenactors will just walk away, so it's, uh, part of the reason why Gods and Generals, which is the follow-up to this movie, but it's actually a prequel, uh, one of the reasons Gods and Generals isn't so great is because it was filmed on 9-11. Like, in the middle of filming 9-11 happens. And uh, it turns out that a lot of reenactors are also reservists. And so their reenactment pool basically just disappeared. Uh, which is why it's um, it's slightly less accurate and it's a little bit lower quality um, than what you'd expect from this fantastic movie. I love the kit too, like guys with their, their metal pumps and everything, it's, it's all fantastic. If you want to paint um, American Civil War troops, watch this movie and just pause it at any point and just start painting. It's, uh, they're all fantastic. This is actually a good movie to use as a record. Again, all the kit and weapons and everything is all provided by the guys themselves. So there we go, club. I love the lack of Confederate uniforms too. It's awesome. Guys not wearing coats. 
that's uh, historically accurate. It would be, you Americans are all backwards, aren't you? So it would be summertime, uh, July, this is July, se- uh, July 2nd, yeah, July 2nd, uh, 1863. So that's your summertime, isn't it? So they would be, yeah, you just leave your coat behind. Really cool to see. I see some fun with that. I really hope you actually see some. There we go, club. Yeah, a lot of surrendering. It's more obvious than other points in the movie. Oh, this actually happened, by the way. This is not something they invented for the movie. Um, this and Chamberlain's uh, scabbard getting shot earlier in the film. This this scene here actually did happen. Um, that would be just such a terrifying moment. <laughs> Confederates have their ranks on their, their um, collars and the spacing of buttons. Um, the British use the spacing of buttons too, so that's sort of a borrow from that. And the uh, Union have shoulder boards. Um, one line for a lieutenant, two for a captain. Uh, eagles are qu- uh, colonels. I'm not sure what the others are. but um, I'm, much, I'm much more up on my British ranks than by American ones, unfortunately. The pistol. The prisoner, sir. Those pistols take a long time to reload too, so you probably didn't even need to take it. Wait here. That's really cool. Even in the Civil War, there was this sort of um, officer's dignity type thing. You know, he didn't take his sword. He's trusting the man. You know, he's given his parole. He's given his word. So the um, the whole dignity and respect of officers does actually translate to the Civil War, um, even if they're not all gentlemen. I think the rest of this is just them chasing down the guys and capturing them, so I'll leave it there. But uh, yeah, so that's the Battle of Little Round Top. Um, let me go. Let me know if you guys like this sort of thing. I would like to do... Um, I might look for some other parts of films that are actually a bit yeah, inaccurate. I wanted to do Round Top first because it's just it's done on a positive note, you know? It's it's really accurate. It's really cool, pointing out all the good things. But uh, if you guys have... Uh, I know there's a couple of scenes in Waterloo that um, need a little bit of critiquing, if I can put it like that. But yeah, if you guys would like to see that, uh, let me know in the comments below. Thank you very much for watching and have a wonderful day.